Well, the stars blazed bright, showed brave men the way. And the guns by night is where they'd lay. With a land so old and harsh, much to be uncovered. These stories we will tell on Australia rediscovered. Come here about it all with Rico. On Australia rediscovered. Ah, oh, how good is that? And welcome to the very first episode of Australia Rediscovered, the podcast with Rico. Of course, I am Rico and I am joined by my very good mate, Dingo Dave. Welcome, Dingo. Good morning, Rico. How are you, mate? Was that you singing there? Certainly not. That was someone who can play and can sing. Uh, a good mate of mine by the name of Tony Cook up there in Charters Towers in Queensland. Thank you for that, Tony. Fantastic, mate. Aren't we lucky we have talented friends? <laughs> it's just as well, mate. If we had to rely on what I've got, we'd be in all sorts. Mate, I actually uh, I wrote down the words to that thing in about a half an hour, and I sent it up to Tony, and I said, can you do something with this, mate, please? And uh, and that's what he came back with, mate, recorded that in his lounge room. Yeah, fantastic. Good on him. He's a champion. All right, so Australia Rediscovered the podcast. What's it all about? So, uh, look, Dingo and I both share a real passion for... Obviously, four-wheel driving, getting out there and experiencing everything that this great country has to offer. But also, one of the topics that we share a great love of is the early exploration expeditions of Australia. And that's what Australia Rediscovered is going to be all about. So there'll be a show that comes later in the year. But in the meantime, we thought we'd uh, kick off our podcast series a little bit early and uh, and give people something to listen to in the short term. Now, the first episode is going to be on one of my favourites, and that is Charles Sturt. Absolutely. Charles Sturt, you know, responsible for, you know, the discovering or if you like mapping out so much of these places that we, we visit nowadays, you know, that, that whole sort of river area, um, so many towns, so many uh, significant and iconic locations along there that, and, you know, he, he was the first person to actually get all that mapped out and see what connected to what. Well, that's right. He found the Murray River. He was the first one to do that. Uh, he also touched on the Darling as well. So, you know, some, some pretty serious accomplishments there. Absolutely, and you know he is one of those. Sadly, I guess he's one of those explorers that doesn't get a lot of coverage in our history textbooks. Um, not quite sure why, because he did do some amazing things. Maybe he wasn't controversial enough. I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He had his detractors. <laughs> this is true. This is true. And I guess we can talk about um, you know the good, the bad, and the ugly in there. But uh, he uh, certainly, in his team, didn't have the. Um, the same sort of dramatic stories that I guess some of the others did. He just was a very, very successful explorer. Yeah, that's right. Well, he wasn't one of the traditional explorers like, um, uh, let's say, Major Thomas Mitchell, um, Augustus Gregory, those sort of blokes. Now, they, they were very, very well-educated in all sorts of things that, that that's really important for uh, for exploration, you know, navigation, botany, all these sorts of things that all these – far more famous explorers are, are very, very good at, but he wasn't any of those things. But but he was very meticulous, and he did get the job done. That's it. I think he, if more than anything else, he actually had a, a great passion. You know, he was an incredibly curious man, um, found himself with problems that maybe, or, you know, grand questions that he'd like to find the answer to, and that's what really drove him on. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's go back to the beginning. He was born in India. Um Sent back to England to live with relatives at the age of five. What a traumatic thing at the age of five to be sent back to England. It's just different times, isn't it? You know, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. He, he was schooled at a, a school called Harrow, which was a boys' school for, for those in the sort of middle to upper class. And at the age of 18, um, and it was a favour from his auntie, actually, uh, he joined the 39th Regiment of Foot for the British Army. Now, normally to go and do that sort of thing, you either... You either had to be uh, someone who's been like to Cambridge or one of those famous schools, but he managed to get in anyway. And during that time in the army, he actually saw quite a bit of action. Uh, he fought alongside the Duke of Wellington in the Peninsula War, which was basically a war with uh, Spain and Portugal versus the French for control of the Iberian Peninsula. And he also fought against the Americans in Canada in the War of 1812. And just after the famous Battle of Waterloo, he returned to Europe. So he saw some action. He did. He was certainly very well travelled, even as a young bloke, you know, and, and to have, uh, I guess, you know, to have fought in such iconic battles, you know, they're certainly ones that we all know about, even though they happened on the other side of the world a long time before the internet, um, and to be in the presence of, you know, such great leaders as Duke of Wellington too. So 
his his formative time, if you like, as an adult or as a as a young soldier would have been significant. Yeah, well, it's obviously had an impact on his later life as well. Now, it was 1827, he was assigned to accompany a ship of convicts on board the Mariner, the convict ship, the Mariner. And he came to Australia and he obviously found the conditions and especially the climate to his liking. And he became very interested in the country. Now, for new arrivals to Australia at that time, there were two things that people were talking about. Firstly was politics and the second was what lay beyond You know, what was on the interior of Australia. It was completely a mystery, an absolute mystery. He sort of figured out pretty early on that he wasn't going to be a politician. He didn't really have much of an interest in that. So the exploration side of things, that that really struck a chord with him. He also happened to be very good mates with the governor of New South Wales, a bloke called Sir Ralph Darling. It was through that relationship that he got appointed the major of brigade and a military secretary, which was a pretty big deal back then. Oh, totally. And uh, that friendship, of course, went on to serve him well um, not just in his first expedition, but also in his second. So one of those, you know, he, he was perhaps a clever man in the right place at the right time, but also had some clever friends. So good on him for capitalising on that. Yeah, the old, it's not what you know, it's who you know sort of thing. It actually, uh, it got up the nose of a couple of other people, particularly Major Thomas Mitchell got pretty upset because he was looking to do some stuff as well. And, and uh, because of the, well, they... They say it's because of the friendship between Darling and, and Sturt that Sturt got the gig and Mitchell didn't, and he made a bit of an enemy for life there. He was also mates with a few other explorers as well. So John Oxley, you've heard of the Oxley Wild Rivers region. That was named after John Oxley. He was one of the first guys to go out and explore some of these uh, rivers in western New South Wales. Alan Cunningham, uh, Cunningham's Gap in Queensland, it's named after him. Mm-hmm. Hamilton Hume, there's a name, the Hume Highway. Uh, And a few others. And through the association, this is where he really took a a serious interest in undertaking his own explorations and specifically the rivers of the interior because it was quite a mystery. And in 1828, in November 1828, Sturt received approval from the governor, Darling, to explore the Macquarie River region in New South Wales. And this is the one that I was talking about with uh, Thomas Mitchell. Mitchell wanted to go and check that out for himself. And, you know, he, he was of the opinion that Anyone who would go out and undertake an exploration expedition like this, there was a certain amount of glory to be had if you were successful. Mitchell believed that Sturt was just in it for the glory. <laughs> Isn't it crazy that there's a bit of uh, animosity between people all trying to achieve the same thing, but uh, maybe trying to achieve it in a different way? Yet we look back now, you know, many of us look back now at these great Australian explorers and we don't think of the fact that they were actually in competition with each other in much of the case. Oh, it's certainly the case, mate. It's just like uh, it's like anything, you know, you get a... A TV show now versus another TV show, and there's a there's always a little bit of uh, you know argy bargy there. I guess this was the same thing, just in a, a different scale. Yeah, I guess the limited resources and a limited amount of fame. Everyone wanted to be the first, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Nowadays, we we just have all these iconic locations and and monuments to all of them. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And the good thing is that we can get out there and check them out ourselves. Now, the first expedition that he did, the one that was approved by Governor Darling to explore the Macquarie. Uh, he ended up following the courses of not only the Macquarie River, but also the Bogan River, which is up there near Ningen, and the Castle Ray River. And although perhaps they didn't realise it at the time, they also touched on the Darling and didn't realise the significance of that river, but they'll, they'll sort of figure that one out later on. They finished up that expedition in April 1829, and they proved that there was no inland sea in northern New South Wales at least. And so the mystery of the western flowing rivers of New South Wales stuck around. That still remained. They still didn't know the source of these rivers and where they went. That's right. So all these northwestern flowing waters, you know, there's a, a whole bunch of rivers there that all, all, you know, we know now all come together into the Darling River, but um, the presence of all these rivers beginning in the east and heading west would have led everyone to believe at the time that there was some kind of inland sea. And of course, when they started following and found that they were actually starting to send south, um, that did put pay to their uh, suggestion of a northern New South Wales inland sea. I'll tell you what, it, it baffles me that these blokes can be out here looking at these rivers. Fair enough, you might know your, your north from your west and your east and your south, but how do they know, for argument's sake, they're sitting at the top of the Darling or, or up near the Darling out there somewhere in the west that's, that's quite a bit north, and then when they're on the foot of the Darling where it reaches the Murray, how do they know it's the same river? Oh, absolutely. You know, we have the Google Maps and GPS and, and you know, for goodness sake, towns and, and mile markers, but um, how these people would actually be able to recognise from the work of someone else that maybe this is a particular bend in a river that someone else has already seen. Um, they must have just been so well read and have spent so much time researching the work of others. Oh, it just does my head in. I'd love to be able to learn to navigate by the stars one day. That's that's on my bucket list of things to try and do. 
That'll be that can be our next mission, mate. That can be your post isolation self learning. <laughs> mate, I'm struggling to get from the bathroom to the kitchen at the moment. <laughs> Do it at night time. Uh, expedition number two, mate, in 1829, Sturt's mate, uh, the governor, Governor Darling, approved a second trip to try and solve the mystery of these western flowing rivers. Now, Sturt wanted to travel the Murrumbidgee, which had already been briefly visited by his mate Hume and Hovel when they undertook their expedition. Hume and Hovel were the first guys to uh, to create a path from Sydney down to Port Phillip, which is now obviously Melbourne, uh, and the Hume Highway that we know and love, or not, <laughs> but we certainly know it, uh, was named after him. Now, they'd already seen the upper reaches of the Murrumbidgee, but they hadn't explored all of it on their trip. That's That was the plan for Sturt. He wanted to go and see exactly what the Murrumbidgee was all about, where it started and where it went. And believe it or not, they took a whale boat with them from Sydney down to there. They carried this whale boat oh, in pieces. That's, that's just, the, the number of times, Rico, that we come across explorers who had... You know their their final goal in mind that they would need X resources and all these other <laughs> these yeah. other amazing things. Um, to have to lug this gear thousands and thousands of kilometres, and in many cases never use it at all. But um, yeah, when we look back at the resource list of some of these great expeditions, it really is quite something. Oh mate, wait until we get to uh, the Burke and Wills story and see what they started out with. My oh goodness. yeah. All right, so a whale boat. Now, a whale boat is not a small boat. We're talking, you know, 20, 25 foot long, probably, you know, in the vicinity of of five or 600 kilos. So they've lugged this thing down to the Murrumbidgee. They've put it together down there and and set sail. On January 7th, 1830, they set sail. Uh, They soon reached the confluence, which is where two rivers join, fancy word. You've got a bird in the background there. I've got all sorts of things going on here, mate. It's it's a um, isolation working from home kind of day, and I have a very friendly magpie. Oh, it's a magpie. Happy days. <laughs> <laughs> so they reached the it's confluence a- of a much larger river, which Sturt named the Murray. So there you go. Sturt discovered the Murray River. Now, they travelled down the Murray until it reached uh, the confluence of the Darling River, which is at uh, it's just outside of Wentworth in New South Wales, and provided proved that all these western flowing rivers in New South Wales eventually led to the Murray, which was pretty cool. Well, I said earlier, how did they know that that was the Darling when they got there? But they did. I'm not going to question it. They followed the Murray down to uh, a place that Sturt ended up naming Lake Alexandrina. And then a few days later, eventually they made it out to the sea. So that's a that's a fair old trip, isn't it? Yeah, quite something. It, I, I was actually reading through um, a website all about the history of the Murray River and the it actually broke down that journey into sort of um, week by week and sort of the, the four-week passage, I think it was roughly, between the mouth of the Murrumbidgee or the confluence of the Murrumbidgee and the finding their way to the lake. Really quite a series of adventures and quite a series of disappointments. I mean, if you do look at Google Maps and, and sort of look into that Murray River region, particularly once it crosses into South Australia, it would be most disappointing. You know, if you're on your little <laughs> whale boat, um, it changes direction so many times. And in oh, fact, yeah. it turns around and heads back to the north again for a long period of time. So it, it actually detailed the the disappointment that they faced day on day where the river was clearly going the wrong direction until finally it swung around and actually started making a southward um, southward passage. And they were in communication with, uh, with, with many Aboriginals they met along the way who were actually indicating to them that they were coming across or about to head out into open water. So it wasn't really until the last three or four days of that massive effort that they actually thought that they were heading back towards the ocean. There you go. It's funny you mentioned the Aborigines because that's something that Sturt was well known for as well, was his ability to um, communicate and and he treated them with respect, which was great. Uh, A few of the other explorers that followed him afterwards certainly did not. But that's one of the things that uh, defines Sturt's legacy as well. So he's gone down the Murray, gone down the Murray. There's actually a really good story. Sorry, Rick, there's a really good story of where... um, where he came across the mouth of the Darling, um, he was actually stopped. He ran aground and was actually stopped by a large group of Aboriginals who were armed and, and acting um, as if they didn't want him around. Um, it wasn't until they did some sort of level of peacemaking there and they had um, a, an older chief who actually sort of came out and stood up and and uh, was prepared to let them pass that they then realised that the little trickle or what seemed to be a little trickle standing behind that sandbar was actually the mouth of the Darling River. So that site, and if you actually, if you zoom in, if you like, on that confluence, um, you can sort of see where that sandbank is. And that's, that's quite a historically significant, um, quite a historically significant location. It was actually 
brought to a stop by Aboriginals and then dealt with it uh, in such a way that nobody was hurt and actually made some peace there. Um, and that right there was the mouth of the Darling. Isn't that amazing? You can actually still see some of these places that you can go and stand where he stood and, and experience what he experienced. And for me, that's that, that that's where the passion and the love of these subjects come from, is the fact that you can still go out and feel what they felt, experience what they experienced. You know, it's just amazing. Oh, I agree with you completely. You know, we find monuments, we find streets or, or regions but to actually be in these locations and to actually come across um, every now and then there's a random can somewhere telling you that a famous explorer passed through here in 1823 or, or something like that. That's, you know, that's where my passion of exploration comes from. And it's, it's seeing the way that these people had to, oh, the, the, the fortitude of these folks to be able to oh, just time. disappear off into the wilderness for months on end um, is really quite impressive. Oh, brave, brave, man. And, and I'll tell you what, they worked hard as well, and, and here's a great example. They they made it down to the sea. They'd followed the Murrumbidgee, they followed the Murray. Then they had to turn around and row all the way back, 2,900 kilometres. And it, and it took a fair old toll on the team, and uh, and Sturt especially. They, they actually had to stop at one stage, uh, I think it was at Narandra in New South Wales, near Wagga, yep. and sent a couple of blokes out to find some supplies because they were running low. And it was during this time that Sturt actually lost his sight for a period of months. He got so crook. When you're navigating, you're constantly looking into the sun with your tools and your equipment. Uh, and it was very common for early explorers to go through this sort of thing where they would have issues with their sight. And like I said, he actually lost it for a period of months. Yeah, it, 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 again, another another of our Australian exploring <laughs> stories where, you know, the, the mission was successful, but the ordeal to get back home, um, you know, they've, they've achieved their goal, but they still were now thousands of kilometres from anywhere and had to actually make and battle their way back again. And, and in many cases, more drama happened on the trip home than it did in the actual journey of exploration. Yeah, that, that's got to be pretty, um, oh, probably heartbreaking It's not the right word, but, uh, you know, you've made this massive trip, you've, you've noted all these things down and you, you've sort of solved a bit of an issue and you, bloody hell, we've got to go back now. <laughs> that's right, or no one will ever know we did it. That's right. And against the current, in summer... Uh, couldn't have been any worse. Oh yeah, I just uh, had you know the, there's actually times in their in their journaling where they're talking about how they were scared, if you like, that the river was flowing so fast. Yeah, and now here they were attempting to paddle against. it. Uh, how depressing. Well, after this expedition, you can't blame him. Sturt took a bit of a leave, and he returned to England. He was almost completely blind at this point, but while he was there, he published his, his works, the, the Two Explorations into the Interior of Southern Australia in 1833, and the importance of his work was finally realised. Now, part of the reward for this work was a grant of land, 5,000 acres. But in order to claim this, he also had to forfeit his pension rights, which is a bit of a dud deal, if you ask me. While he was in England in 1834, he married Charlotte Green, who was the daughter of a family friend, and they soon sailed once again for Australia. I love that. I love that he um, took his leave. You know, went back to recover. You know, clearly he was he was you know very, very quite sick and quite ill after all that. Went back to England to recover and got married, picked up his new wife, and straight back to Australia again. I think that that says a lot for the passion he had for the country. Yeah, that's right. So uh, when he came back, he went to his land grant. It was uh, basically down near Canberra, and he named the property Belconnen which uh, we know, of course, is the suburb of Belconnen today. So there's one of the uh, one of the little things you can take out of that. While he was there, he did a bit of cattle herding and decided he wanted to prove that the Hume and the Murray were the same river. Now, I haven't mentioned this before, but uh, when Hume and Hovel went and did their trip, they crossed the Murray, unbeknownst at the time this was the same river. Uh, they named it the Hume. Then, obviously, Sturt's gone down and called it the Murray. People were not sure if they were two separate rivers or the same river, so he decided that he was going to go and prove that it was one and the same, and uh, eventually the name the Murray stuck. All right, so after all of that, he decided that it was time to head back to Belconnen, and he wanted to go and settle in South Australia. So he, he sold the property, moved over there, and uh, set up a place called The Grange, which was the name of his homestead, and the suburb of Grange in Adelaide is now named right after that place there. So there you go. Yes, and I guess for his next exploration, um, Adelaide was the perfect place to uh, to base himself. So he'd, I guess in his head, he'd... Um, He'd uh, done what he wanted to do based out of New South Wales. He'd pretty much found his way all the way to um, what would become Adelaide, and that now became his place to uh, call home and go further from there. Well, it's funny because he did these these first two expeditions out of Sydney. There's not too much in Sydney named after him, but in Adelaide, I'll tell you what, there's quite a few things. Oh, absolutely, yes, that's correct. You know, he's, he's quite the... Um, and, and he's certainly not like we can say he's the only explorer to have based himself out of Adelaide. You know, there was, there was quite a number of very, very famous explorers, maybe... Maybe Adelaide was just a bit more of a frontier town. They took a little bit more of an ownership 
of their explorers. Well, look, they were certainly closer to the centre of Australia than any of the others, and it was probably within their best interest to find out what was up there to see if it was useful for farming and the like. So the third expedition, and probably the most famous one now, Sturt always had this belief that there must be some great inland sea or saltwater lake in the middle of the country. For him, it just made sense. This is where all of these rivers must come from or lead to or something to that effect. And so he wanted to be the first explorer as well to plant his foot in the centre of Australia. Of course, the glory that would go with that would be pretty significant. So in August 1844, he set out with a party of 15 men, 200 sheep, six drays and another whaling boat. Uh, Again, great big heavy five, 600 kilo whaling boat to explore northwestern New South Wales and advance into central Australia. Uh, Along the way, they travelled along the Murray and the Darling. Of course, they've seen all of this before. They passed the future site of Broken Hill. And when they got a bit further north, they ended up being stranded by the summer conditions near uh, what's today known as Milparinka. They actually got stuck there for something like six months. They just could not escape because of the lack of water and the sheer oppressive heat. I was actually uh, following one history of, of this part of their exploration where it was that hot during that period that they were stuck there in Milparinka that they had to actually dig holes or dig little caves into the side of the riverbank so that he could journal, so that he could actually write. Because otherwise it was that hot that the ink was actually drying up or evaporating, if you like, off his pen before he could actually put it to paper. So just an extreme <laughs> circumstance. And like, you and I have been to Little Parinka. You know, it's a stunning little town. Like, what's left of the place is actually is really quite impressive. Um, but also such a historical, like a ancient historical town in terms of all the fossils and and the evidence, if you like, of the inland sea that wasn't far from there, but certainly of the inland rainforest. So it would have been a, a, for a clever guy like this, it would have been a really interesting place, you know, certainly for the first couple of months anyway, to have been stuck. Um, it's such a geologically rich location. Yeah, that's right. They found gold there as well, which is uh, how Milparinka came to be. I wouldn't mind getting up there with a metal detector myself and have a bit of a wander around, but uh, I don't fancy the idea of having to dig a cave to stay out of the heat. You can have that. No, no, let's do it in winter. <laughs> now the rains eventually did come and uh, this allowed Sturt to escape Milparinka and he moved north and he established a depot at Fort Grey uh, which is now located within the site, the Sturt National Park with a small group of men including the yet to be famous explorer John McDool Stewart Now John McDool Stewart, there's another story in itself This is a bloke who did a there's lot many of many stories there mate Yeah, he was there as a draftsman Now Stewart became famous as an explorer and one of the very best cartographers or map makers in the history of the universe. That bloke was a bit of a genius. So with Stuart, Sturt and Stuart, they pressed on and they came across what is now known as Sturt Stony Desert. And then they made their way north up to the Simpson Desert. Obviously, they weren't able to go much further because I tell you what, if you have been out there, you'll know there's no water out there. Absolutely none. So they, they, acres, acres thousands of sand. And thousands of kilometres of dunes and sand and rock. Yep. So they, they turned back and went back to the depot. Uh, Sturt made a second attempt to reach the centre of Australia, but he developed scurvy, and scurvy is a horrible horrible disease caused by a lack of vitamin C. You know, a lot of animals out there, they can make, they generate, their bodies generate their own vitamin C. With uh, with humans, that doesn't happen. And it doesn't take too long for you to start to feel the effects of a lack of vitamin C. Um, when you get scurvy, you get tiredness, you get bone soreness, which is just debilitating. You bruise really easy. You get gum disease. Your, your teeth just ache. You get dry mouth, dry eyes, which, you know, makes it hard even just to blink. You end up getting jaundice, fever, convulsions. Your your nails lift off their bed on your fingers and toes and eventually you die. And what a horrible, horrible, painful, slow, agonising way to die. Yeah, we hear about it so often, don't we, with early early stories of exploration. We certainly heard about it with, um, you know, even the, the ships coming out from the UK, if they had some kind of uh, problem with their food supply and they didn't have those, those sort of appropriate vitamins how by the time they landed in Australia they would have a, a significant number of their crew afflicted with scurvy it, you know it's we think of it as, as sort of one of those oldie timey diseases but it's still something that you know if, if you were in a position of forced starvation if you found yourself fairly sort of able to survive it is something that would afflict a modern person as well absolutely 
Yeah, and not fun. Uh, so, you know, as scurvy took hold, his health obviously broke down and he was forced to abandon any further explorations north. John Brown, who was the surgeon of the expedition, he assisted Sturt and he actually took over leadership of the party and they travelled a total of 4,800 kilometres to bring it back to safety, which is uh, pretty epic. Yeah, and for much of that, um, our mate was actually uh, was in the stretcher and being carried back in the drain. So his, his team really did rally around him to get him back. Um, he was affected very, very badly by it. Yep. Well, that was his last expedition. He obviously finally proved that there was no inland sea out there. You know, he got as far as the Simpson Desert. I, I reckon that's not a bad effort. Not a bad effort at all. No, the, the distance and the, the, I guess, the differing terrains that he took on in that mission, um, very different from the earlier one in the Murrumbidgee and the Murray, uh, where it was all, if you like, river iron or all based on water. This was, you know, in, in essence, a, a desert crossing, you know, not far from Broken Hill. You actually find yourself in in what, for all intents and purposes, we would class as a desert. Um, Once you start heading north north out of there, yeah, it's it's real tough country. Absolutely. All right, so um, that that was basically Sturt's exploration expeditions. Now, obviously, there was more to his life than that. In 1847, he decided to go back to England on leave. He arrived there, and he was duly presented with the Royal Ge- Geographical Society's gold medal, which is a big deal. There were quite a few other famous explorers that, that went on to grab that as well, but that was pretty awesome. He also prepared his next little publication, The Narrative of an Expedition into Central Australia, but it didn't get published until 1849, and by this time, again, he was suffering pretty badly with poor ice. So eventually, after having a bit of a rest in England, he again, once again, returned to Australia. I tell you what, I wouldn't mind some of his frequent flyer points. Uh, They arrived in August 1849. He was immediately appointed the Colonial Secretary with a seat in the Legislative Council. Again, proving that these connections are absolutely everything when it comes to getting a plum job. Oh, look, he had done so much, hadn't he? He'd um, managed to uh, to organise these three major expeditions with um, you know, almost no loss of life. Like they're, they're not going to say that it was um, incident free, but compared to other explorations at the time, he did actually manage his people and his resources exceedingly well. So those people who had funded, if you like, Governor Darling in the earlier ones, and those people who had funded in um, out of uh, Adelaide, where he was actually the uh, was he the Surveyor General Rex? Did I get that right? He he certainly yeah. took a um, significant government position there. Um, he had uh, impressed everyone. So when it was time to return um, back into Adelaide, he uh, he certainly jumped into those higher levels of government very quickly. Yeah, he actually took the role of uh, the Surveyor, Surveyor General of South Australia. And not long after that, the, the bloke called Edward Frome, you've heard of Frome Lake up in there in South Australia, he, he arrived and uh, he'd been promised the gig. So <laughs> Sturt had to take a back seat and, uh, and old mate Frome took that job from him. Uh, and it wasn't long after that that he went back to England yet again. So back to Cheltenham in England in uh, 1853, and that's where he decided to stay. Looked after his kids. They all went off to join the army, his, his three sons, and they all had you know really, really successful careers in the army. One of them became a colonel, the other a major general, which is pretty full on. Yeah, he also um, was encouraged by his friends to apply for a knighthood. Um, he didn't get it, but he, he is on the record there of, of having been, if you like, shortlisted to be a sir something. Um, but yeah, that's a little sort of touch back to that um, that for king and country and, and all the other things that were going on at the time. Um, yeah. He did apply. He, he's on the record as having been shortlisted to become a knight. Well, after he passed away in June 1869, he died suddenly. Obviously survived by his wife, his sons, his daughter. But his wife, Mrs. Sturt, she was granted a pension of eighty pounds a year, and the Queen granted her the title of Lady Sturt, as if her husband's nomination for the knighthood had been gazetted. So that was pretty cool. I don't know what exactly the benefits of being a knight are in terms of whether it's monetary or uh, exemptions from tax or things and of that nature. But uh, you know, obviously meant something to somebody. So, yeah, she got to call herself Lady Stir for the rest of her life as well. Yeah, it's a nice little sort of epitaph to the story there because we didn't really hear much of her. You know, she would have been, she must have been a very tolerant person. I, I had him across stories there on that third one when they had been delayed for so long that many of the uh, particip- participating party, their families had actually believed them to be dead and held um, memorial services for them. So I couldn't <laughs> find anything on whether um, Sir's wife had done that for Charles, uh, but there was certainly members of the touring party who were, um, for all intents and purposes, assumed dead. Yeah, what a horrible thing for your family to be stuck at home for, for months and sometimes years, just not knowing what on earth is going on, whether or not they're coming back. 
Yeah, that, that's just nasty stuff, isn't it? Oh, look, they've, they've left 18 months prior. Um, and you've heard nothing, nothing at all from them. It wasn't like they were passing through little towns who could pass the message back. You know, this was true frontier country. There was no one other than the original inhabitants around, and there certainly wasn't the capacity to send a message back home. <laughs> Quite incredible. Yep. Well, look, let's have have a bit of a, a quick look at his legacy. So, obviously, he, he found some, some pretty significant stuff and some rivers and proved a few geological things that made life easier for those who came after him. But uh, stuff that's been named after Sturt, we've got the city of Charles Sturt in Adelaide's western suburbs, uh, the Adelaide suburb of Sturt, the electoral division of Sturt in Adelaide, so this is all South Australian-based stuff. Charles Sturt University, being a school teacher, you'd like that one? Absolutely. That's, um, many, many good courses have come out of Charles Sturt. Uh, the Sturt Highway, which runs from Wagga to Adelaide. Uh, there's Sturt's Desert Pea, Sturt's Desert Rose, the Sturt Stony Desert, Sturt National Park. And there's even a training ship in the Navy called the T.S. Sturt. So there you go. Yeah, long a long-lived legacy there. You know, many of those places. You and I have travelled the Sturt Highway. Yep, um, many on, times. On one occasion, actually, I think about it. Um, Sturt says that he was interesting. He didn't actually name it. It was named after him. So he um, had noted a desert tea in much of his journaling and his writing. Um, but my research showed, told me that it was actually Dampier that um, found it and classified it, and then it was named after Sturt in, in his honour. Well, there you go. Have you ever sucked on a desert pea? I have not. It's very, very sweet. It's like honey. Ah, very good. I know that um, you would, of course, be aware that the Birdsville uh, Bakery has just been bought out by the or bought by the people who own the Birdsville pub. Yeah, that's and great. They just news. did a big clean up last week. Put it on Facebook, and their um, the plan is to replant the desert pea, which had been allowed to sort of um, go by the wayside over the last year or so. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, they had those right in the front of that uh, bakery there. It's a great little thing. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. You know, it was it was quite a you know, you've arrived in Birdsville, here's the beginning of your desert adventure and um here sure enough is the third desert pea sitting out front of the uh, Birdsville bakery. Yeah, that's perfect. Look, we're gonna take a quick break and after the break we're gonna come back with another guest, uh, lady by the name of Ruth Sandow, who is instigating some stuff for four wheel drivers. So she's she's uh, in charge of this program that allows us, as four-wheel drivers, to go out and experience what Sturt experienced, see what he saw, felt what he felt, uh, and this is really exciting. So we'll be back right after this break. How was your day, sweetie? Terrible. A deal that I've been working on for weeks fell apart and... Yep. I- <sighs> Sounds like the time the gearbox went in my patrol. How is that the same, Terry? If you really love cars, Auto One. <laughs> All right, we're back now, and we are very excited to uh, welcome Ruth Sandow to our little podcast. Ruth uh, is located up there in uh, northwestern New South Wales, and she has undertaken a very, very exciting project called Sturt Steps. Ruth, tell us all about it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, So, as everybody should know, and maybe everybody doesn't know, but back in 1845, Charles Sturt undertook um, the first of one of the a big inland um, expedition uh, trying to get up um, into the centre of the country just to see what it was like, um, uh, open it up for grazing purposes and, and so on. So it turned into quite a debacle, really, because um, that area, as we now know, um, the subject is quite significant drought. And so the whole expedition was um, very challenging um, throughout, and to his credit, um, Charles Sturt led his men uh, pretty much right up, you know, around Birdsville eventually, but uh, spent a lot of time in our corner country, uh, out from Kibberbar and Wilkerinka, that, that area. And so what we're trying to do is, is create um, a circular touring route that will enable four-wheel drive enthusiasts and, and um, SUV drivers access into that country so that they can still experience um, a lot of the landscape and um, views that Sturt experienced during that expedition, but also put in place um, infrastructure that will inform, better inform, educate, assist uh, navigation to, uh, throughout that whole landscape. So we've, we've got to, that approximately 1,100 kilometres of a circular touring route that will start in Broken Hill and will cross over the Barrier Ranges as um, Sturt and the expedition did 
um, come up on the western side adjacent to the um, wild dog fence and um, and then circle back uh, on up to North Parenta, out to Depot Glen, uh, to Tibberborough, uh, out towards Cameron Corner, um, and then uh, some quite back down the highway to Broken Hill, or vice versa. I mean, it doesn't matter which way people go. So it's pretty exciting. Well, that's fantastic. So basically what you're doing is... Uh basically trip planning for, for those who are interested in going to check out corner country and, and sort of western New South Wales. And if you haven't been out there, I'll tell you what, it is some of the most spectacular country found anywhere in Australia. It is by far one of my most favourite places to visit up there around corner country. And anywhere north of Broken Hill, really, like you said, for this touring route, 1,100 k's, it's just spectacular country. The sunsets out there are something else. They certainly are. I mean, it, and... I think for those of us who, who have lived in the area really appreciate um, its beauty and, and the difficulties <laughs> and challenges um, that are part and parcel of that. Uh, but we love seeing people come through um, and enjoy the fact that they are learning something, but they're having fun. Um, they can stay on station properties along the route, um, as well as um, you know really nice accommodation in um, Milparenta and Tibaba. Um, part of the project um, will be putting in additional accommodation infrastructure, but also museum spaces in Milparinka, creating a waterhole similar to that which um, Sir camped against uh, first at Milparinka before the team went out to Depot Glen. Um, and uh, a, another part of the exciting part is out at Port Grey, where there was also a, a camp. There's an endangered species um, rehabilitation project going on to, to, to um, University of New South Wales, and we are going to be part of that as well, uh, providing some infrastructure. Um, we'll have arts, um, sculptures along the road, indig- interpreting Indigenous history, as well as European history and um but, you know about exploration of the mining history of the area, which is also you know a significant part of that uh, that area. Um, so it's pretty exciting. This sounds fantastic. You know, Rico and I've explored that area a couple of times over a couple of different crossings, but as always, we've never really had the time to, to delve in. You know, we we got to spend an afternoon and a night at um, El Parinka, which was incredible. Obviously, Tibbara and many many other places out there. Um, it'll be an amazing guide in terms of, I guess, showing people just how much or how rich every location is, which will actually help people in planning. You know, perhaps perhaps rather than thinking of that sort of area as a pass-through location, it will become a destination in itself. And if you well, know that... Yeah, go on. Oh, well, I was going to say, that that's exactly what, what we're wanting um, to do. Um, we will have uh, a lot more information for people It'll be safer. On our Facebook page, Corner Country and Outback Australia, we ran a survey um, some time ago asking people just what what were the inhibiting factors um, for people going out there. And a lot, a lot of people said they didn't know where to go. They felt insecure um, driving on some of the more remote roads. But, you know, uh, avid four-wheel drivers won't have those um, those fears, of course. They're, they're pretty, pretty uh, gung ho, not gung ho, but <laughs> out there uh, embracing that sort of um, uh, wildness, if you like. But uh, we found that uh, we, that if we um, can put in wayfinder signs so people don't get lost, then um, they will feel much more secure and be able to stop and look and think, hey, is this. You know, at this point, Sir, for example, in his expedition, pulled up on a remote uh, remote area there, looked across uh, what are now uh, station paddocks, and could see wagons um, off in the distance as they trundled along with um, with the expedition. Um, places that um, people didn't didn't don't know about, and uh, we hope to bring that all to them uh, in a safe, um, friendly way that uh, will really enhance the experience of adults and children too because it's pretty important. I've yeah. actually just gone to your Facebook page and it is outstanding. There is some amazing photography. Um, 
So we should definitely link that in the show notes, Rico. That's um, yeah, definitely, definitely. There's uh, there's a couple of sites there that we're going to put into the the links on our Facebook pages. Um, obviously, one there for Ruth, but also another good friend of ours, uh, Simon Bayless, who runs a website called Red Dust Snow. Definitely check that out and subscribe to his newsletter because. He has some amazing stuff on there about this part of the world. Uh, some great notes on on trip prep and touring routes and those sort of things. So Red Dust Snow, check that out on Facebook and check out the website. Be sure to subscribe to his newsletter because there's some great stuff there. And I know that Ruth has done some work with Simon over the years as well. Yeah, so I, I've actually worked with Simon probably um, on and off for, well, more on and off, um, the past 10 years. Um, I used to manage the um, the corner country um, website as well, but uh, it's just with everything else going on, it's become uh, overwhelming for me, if you like. So at this stage, Simon has incorporated the corner country component of our uh, website into uh, the Red Dirt Snow uh, site. So yes, people can um, can look on there and see the linkages. Basically, right across, you know, uh, from Melbourne, Sydney, wherever, right through into our area. So follow the the different linkages and so on. So yeah, all it's all good information. But the more people who will jump on our Facebook page, which is, and I appreciate you giving it um, the nod there, the more we can inform and show people just how fantastic that area is up in the corner country. <laughs> <laughs> you got the dog in the background going nuts there. No, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, nah, it's all good. It's all I'm good. Apologize. You know, and there's some some definitely some great places to visit up there, and the people appreciate it. You know, you've got Pack Saddle, Mill Parinka, Tibbaburra. You know, the corner store if you want to go as far as the corner country itself, and then beyond that, you know, just amazing little places to visit. When you go and do these trips, it's really important. And Dingo Dave and I have been really guilty of this. Is You've got to stop and smell the roses. Quite often we don't because we've been out there filming TV programs and so on and, and you know, we've got pretty rigid sort of timelines to stick to. But if you're planning a trip out here, just, just add an extra day on the end so you can spend that extra half an hour in a town and, you know, soak it up, go for a walk around, read the signs, have a look at uh, the history of the place because, after all, that's why you're out there, you know, and that's what this show is all about is providing a little bit of background on, on why these places exist and then you know, how you can get out there yourself. So make sure you check out Ruth's Facebook page. Make sure you check out Red Dust Snow, uh, the website and the Facebook page as well because there's some great information there. Thanks for joining us, Ruth. We really appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you, Ruth. Yes, thank you. And look, good luck, everyone. Once this COVID-19 business is uh, put to rest, um, I'm sure everyone will be dying to get out in the bush. So we'd love to see them. See you right on you. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Thanks for that. Yep. All right. Well, uh, that that brings our very first podcast uh, pretty much to an end, I reckon. So we've covered a fair bit of Sturt, uh, where you can go, places to get some information. So hopefully, as Ruth said, once this is all blown over, you can start making some plans and get out there yourself. Well, we certainly have some plans to get out there, don't we, Rico? Too right we do, mate. That's going to be one of the first places we go. With. <laughs> I should mention uh, we're going to be doing the tag along tours as well. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully later this year. You know, we, we should have had a few under our belt by now, but uh, yeah. that, that's still a happening thing. So make sure you head to that Facebook page, Australia Rediscovered with Rico. You'll see all the information there on our Tag Along Tours. We do those in conjunction with the guys from Adrenaline Motorsport or Adrenaline Off-Road, I should say. We actually have a trip planned for Outback New South Wales, which is going to kick off down near Wentworth, uh, the confluence of the Darling and the Murray. We'll follow the river up and uh, eventually make our way up to corner country so that is going to be right in the steps of Sturt so if you've enjoyed this podcast and want to get out there and see that country go and have a look at that obviously we don't have dates right now because we're not quite sure what's happening with COVID-19 and when everything's reopening but uh, once that is sorted out I'll tell you what we will be up and running. Probably worth mentioning too Rico that when we put these tagalongs together they're not intended to be an extreme event and they're also not intended to be a drive all day. No, 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 no. There will be opportunity to explore. There'll be opportunity to, you know, immerse ourselves. Um, There's nothing worse than going to an amazing region and just flying through it at 100 kilometres now. So these are they're a family friendly, you know, explorer kind of focus um, tag along tour. Yeah, that's right. So last thing we want to do is put you or your vehicle in jeopardy. This is a 
this community to have a bit of fun, get out there and see a few bits and pieces. So, yeah, it should be great. It should be great. All right, we're going to wind that up. So, look, if you'd like to find out more information on the Tag Along Tours, head to Australia Rediscovered with Rico, the Facebook page. You can head to my website, rico.com.au. Uh, you can check out Dingo Dave on Facebook as well. What's your uh, your handle on there, Dingo? I am Dingo Dave 4x4 on Facebook, Rico. Awesome. So check out Dingo's page. Give that a like. Uh, and also the Rico page on Facebook while you're there. You'll see all of the information on the podcast, the new show that's coming up. I can't say too much about that just yet, but that's happening. And, of course, the Tag Along Tours. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dingo Dave, for being along. Thank you, Rick. It's been fun. All right, we'll do it again in the next uh, fortnight. Cheers, folks. Sounds like a plan. Cheers, mate.